Uh, the title is Entrepreneurship as a Lifestyle, but I will use uh, my previous startup, Dynamic Rock Support, as an example of how, how my life uh, was. Dynamic Rock Support is a spin out from the university here, uh, from one of the professors, Charlie Lee. It, we, uh, the one and only concept we had was a rock bolt. A rock bolt is what keeps tunnels and mines from collapsing. So sometimes when you drive through a tunnel, you can see something sticking into the wall. That is normally a rock bolt, and uh, believe me, you, you really need it. Um, we got funding from local Trondheim investors, mainly because of relations, uh, and we had to focus on three markets because we didn't have all the money in the world. It was uh, Nordic, Canada, and uh, Australia. And we also, after a while, luckily uh, happened to sell a bit to, to Chile. Uh, we didn't have money to set up a plant, so we needed to outsource manufacturing, which we did. Um, and after five years, it was acquired by a large industrial player, uh, which was a great day, because uh, not only from the financial perspective, but now finally we had uh, reached our goals in terms of building a substantial company that someone else uh, would take over and bring to a more global uh, and higher scale. Uh, in 2013, they sold rock bolts for six, between 60 and 70 million kroners, which would be around $10 million. Um, I think that's a good number. Based on that, they started on zero. Uh, they were, we were on zero revenues three years before, and we were only seven employees when we uh, were sold. Um, and what we are most proud of is that we managed to sell to large mining giants like Extrata, Vale, LKB. You might not have heard about them, but believe me, selling to a big industrial player is hard. It's really hard. So if you ever get a chance to go to sales course, attend it. Um, we started with an invention, and we created a company out of it. I'll tell a little bit about that. I'll tell, how, tell you a bit how we started, how we funded it. I'm not, I'm not spending much time on it. Uh, and how we built something that eventually succeeded. Please feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. Uh, and as you can see, the exit point is in bold because that was always our goal, to find someone else to take over and, and, and uh, yeah, be more professional about it. This is Charlie. When you figure out something, I mean, if you ever want to become an entrepreneur, you don't have to be smart. You don't have to get a, find the idea yourself. There's hundreds of professors with very good ideas uh, in their office. Right? So just go to them, approach them, or you can go to tech transfer offices. They have uh, 20 ideas every year that are ready to, to start on. Um, and they will be happy to receive you and see if you can be the right person to, to start a company with them. This is Charlie. He is um, it's from China. The Communist Party said, if you want an education, you need to go to Sweden to become a rock engineer. And Charlie smiled and said, yes. Uh, he did that, and then he became very good at it. Uh, probably one of the best in Sweden ever. He got a PhD, he worked for a Swedish mining company, and he figured, oops, the mine is collapsing. Why? He figured it was because of uh, not so good rock bolts, and he figured out why, and eventually he got up a smart idea after coming to Trondheim and being a professor here, how to solve that problem. Charlie's got connections. He knows people working on rock bolts and mining industry all over the world. That really helps when you start a company. And he's always smiling. So if you ever get a chance to smile, do it. Because it's so much easier to relate to you then in a positive way, and you will get more business as well. Charlie's a great example. His network, his smile, and his reputation uh, is one of the major reasons why we succeeded. Uh, Charlie actually figured a growing problem. Why is that? Probably because most mines are going deeper. And the deeper you go, the more rock falls you have. Uh, so the, the problem Charlie solved was actually growing, which, is, which was quite good news uh, for us. Um, this is how it looks. You can see that you need a lot of mesh, you need a lot of bolts to, to keep the rock from breaking up and collapsing all over. And, and this is probably only on 800 meters. 
in South Africa, they're down on 5,000 meters uh, doing mining. So it's, it's a dangerous business and they need uh, better solutions. So the lowest bolt CO2 is the old fashioned solution called uh, re, uh, reinforcement bar. Uh, you can see it on all construction sites all over. You can see them in, in this wall. Um, doesn't look too fancy, doesn't work good. We made another design that actually can absorb energy from the mountain. So when a mountain starts moving, we absorb the energy and then the movement stops. It doesn't collapse. Um, NTNU has a tech transfer office. Their job is to patent things, uh, see if there's a commercial potential, and then find people to start a company and go out and conquer the world with it. Um, if you have a chance to get in touch with those people, do it, because they have so many fancy uh, and, and cool ideas that need people like you. Um, I st had a first meeting with them in May 2008 about starting this. Uh, and already then, even before we had a business plan, we invited three investors. And we said, we want each of you to be hopefully interested in this within six months. We hope that they would uh, go into some kind of bidding war to, to become investors. Um, and it turned out that actually two of them invested after a while. And investors, you might get nervous about the word, but they, actually, they, they like to, to have a cup of coffee even with you, even with students, to discuss ideas. And you can ask them, what should I do to make my idea be interesting for, for you? And that's what we did. And also we had help from a consultancy company to interview customers. And while you're students, you are not, you're not kind of threatening to anyone. So if you have a question about anything related to business or industry, you can pick up the phone, you can say that you're from NTNU or whatever, uh, and ask any kind of question, like, who are you buying bolts from? What do they cost? What kind of agreements do you go into? Uh, all those kind of things, and most likely you will get a real answer. When you've started a company, then it's too late, because you, you might be threatening to someone. So uh, that's another reason to start while, while you're a student. Um, when we had consultants doing, doing, uh, doing this for us, it gave the same effect. They were not threatening anyone. So we basically got a lot of uh, interesting uh, figures from, uh, from even our competitors. And then we had to figure out, OK, there's a global need for this. Where do we focus? You can see those, those pie charts. Uh, the size represents how big the mining industry is. The green part is where they have mines kind of uh, without digging. And the red part is when they're underground. So you can see that we were definitely going for the red parts. We were looking for countries that are sophisticated, that value uh, HSE. And in that case, we figured that uh, Sweden, Canada, and Australia would be the right markets to go to. And then some people will probably say, why not South Africa? Why not Russia? Why not China? Why not Eastern Europe? And partly because in uh, like South Africa, for instance, uh, three of our competitors were fined for um, kind of fixing their prices in a collaboration, which is not legal. So to, to enter that market will be hard. And other places, they don't value uh, a life. So in China, for example, when, when people die in accidents, the family which is left gets probably a bag of rice, and that's it. Everyone's happy, and it's so easy to find someone else to do the job. While in other countries, it's, um, it's, it's a bit different. And then, after starting the company in October 2008, does anyone remember October 2008, September 2000, October 8? What happened? Lehman Brothers, financial crisis, good timing for looking for money? Not so good. Uh, and also coming with a mining industry invention in Norway, which doesn't really have a tradition for that, uh, not so easy. But based on a good business plan um, and statement from customers, we eventually uh, managed to sign with two Trondheim investors, Proventure Seed and Salvas and Thumbs, um, and they followed us uh, the entire journey. We asked for like six million kroners. Guess how much we needed? 
20. And luckily, these investors got deep pockets, so, and, and they believed in us, so that's why they kept on funding us. So finding the right investors with deep pockets, that's, that's really important. Uh, this is a guy in Bhutan. He works on a yeah, power plant in the mountains of Bhutan. And you can see that little thing sticking out of his wall down there in the corner. That's a rock bolt. And that's what happened when rock bolts fail. It could happen in this wall right now if, it got, if it's, it's too much pressure in there. The bolts would actually just shoot out. A bit dangerous. So how did we spend the money? Uh, more or less only on the team and, and travels. Uh, and you can, what we needed was good salespeople, right? We need someone to sell to these mining giants. And how do you find good salespeople in the mining industry? First of all, is it an attractive industry to be in? I mean, you have to go 3,000 meters down and sell to people with dirt on their hand. Is that attractive? Would you do that? Most likely not. So it was hard to find a team. And this was the best team we were able to get. I have lots of funny stories and even jokes about all of them. Um, but the core group here in Norway, which didn't have experience from the mining industry, uh, managed uh, to teach these people behave and to become good salespeople in a way that gave us success in all, in all markets. Um, It's one of those that is not at all from the mining industry, and that's Tron. Tron is excellent on uh, negotiating. Um, that's really a person you would need. Someone to, to send out to, to find good pricing on whatever you need to manufacture. He would, he, he's not nervous in any negotiation. He believes he has a more powerful position than what he really has. And without him, we would not have good pricing on our bolts. So, um, Finding people like that is, is really, really uh, critical. Most of the others were already selling rock balls from competitors when they, when they joined us. So the product, which is pictured here, looks really simple, right? So you, you would believe it's so easy to manufacture, but the devil is in the details. There's lots of different steel, lengths, diameters, anchor locations, uh, threads, some customers say, would say noted because it's not packed and, and stamped and labeled the right way. So, so you need someone like Tron to take care of it in a professional way. So as an entrepreneur, you cannot do everything. This is probably one of the most important pictures. Whatever kind of job you have, you should have fun. You have to travel sometimes. You have to spend some nights away from home anyway and, and make sure that you have a lot of fun on the way. Uh, I think that's really, really important. And sometimes you get to hear a lot of interesting business information also when, uh, while having fun. So it, it actually gives you a good uh, return on investment. By the way, those were two of my colleagues. Hugh to the left, he is from Australia, and uh, Tron is from uh, south of Trondheim in Norway. When we started with the product, we believed safety was enough. Everybody would understand safety is important, but I was wrong. You always need to count in the economic impact. So we needed to calculate what is the cost of a broken arm, what is the cost, cost of, a, uh, of a life, um, and how long do you have to shut down a mine when you have had a rock fall. So we need to calculate all that and, and tell the customer, this is how much you're actually losing today, and this is the effect you'll have if you buy from us. So from 2008, zero revenue, 2009, zero in revenue, 2010, zero more or less. We had one little agreement in Australia in late 2010, which gave us like a million kroner revenues in early 2011. And that little agreement made our investors believe in us. Okay, you will have another five millions, which was great. Because suddenly in September 2011, the Swedish customer said to us, I'm sorry, but we will probably not buy more balls for you, and we'll probably not buy anyone next year. Later, the same afternoon, they call us, and they said, uh, your competitor had some problems with our testing. 
So can you please manufacture as many bolts as you can for the rest of the year? Of course. <laughs> so uh, that gave us 20 million kroners of revenue, just like that. And that shows how it scales. You have to live with zero in revenue for a few years, but suddenly when you get customers, they, they're not just buying one bolt, they're buying tens of thousands. So um, finding some of that, something that scales is also uh, critical. This is a picture of a comp uh, customer site. Let me see if I can, can I point with this one? Um, yep. Okay, this is the customer, uh, this is the mine, right? And now the mine is digging deeper in this direction. This is the main office. This is where we thought we could get uh, orders. And they were running the old mine. And we tried for three years, no results. And then we figured we really have to be there more often just to get the right information and try to sell. So in those little buildings there, they have Sweden's biggest investment project on land ever. Because they were moving the mine from one level to a deeper level. It cost them like 30 billion Swedish kroners. And they were looking for new ideas. So in minus 20, uh, during the winter, we, we were out with, outside the gate. We had no key. We had no right to enter the property. We just asked the customer, can we please come in today and just sit in the coffee or lunch room or whatever and just be nice? And then you would pick up some information, you're invited to some meetings, and you get to deliver the, um, the message. Then it turns out, someone in this building has a competing product, it is manufactured there by a competitor. Is this a big city? No. And what does that mean? Probably the one buying is the cousin of the one selling. Is it easy to compete with this one? Not at all. It's really hard. And do you think this guy only tells the truth about your product? No. So we had to be there. We had to stay in the hotel, had to stay in the lobby and stay uh, in the office and, and kind of be seen. Uh, and they had to trust us. And I had to keep on smiling and being nice. And, um, Eventually, they, they were convinced that we, were, we had the right solution. So you can see this is our team again, <laughs> having fun in different ways. It's, it's, it's really not easy to manage a team, but we gave all of them a lot of uh, freedom. Uh, as long as we had clear goals and they delivered, we were happy. Mostly they delivered, uh, but actually, uh, a question to you. We had four salespeople abroad that were, had 20 years each of experience selling rock balls, and then we had four people in Norway with no experience. Which of the two teams sold the most? Norwegian. Yes. Why? The Norwegians sold most because they had the entrepreneurial perspective. We did what it took to get the order. We just didn't believe that our old contacts would, would give us the order immediately. We did, didn't believe that the product was good enough to sell by itself. We focused on, uh, on sales and uh, being present. This is how our customer stores rock balls. What happens in the winter? It snows, which is nice, because then they forget about them and they buy more balls. <laughs> Uh, after a while, we figured uh, you should probably store them more appropriately, like, like this. So we, we, uh, we told them that. And with each bolt, you need a plate. And how do they store the plates? In a horrible way. With lots of corrosion and problems, and sometimes they, they're not sure where, where, where are the plates. And can you use a bolt without a plate? No. So what do you do then? You buy another bolt, which is nice. So uh, this is how our customers look like. Um, and when you get to know them, you have a feeling for what they would like to do, what they would like to talk about, where they would like to eat. And when you do all those kind of things with them, then they're quite happy. And then, then it's easier for them to, to do an agreement with you. So being present, um, doing sales training, and then you probably need two questions. 
If you ever have a problem, you should ask yourself these two questions. Who do you want to call? And what are you going to say? Because there's always someone who's been in the same miserable situation with the same challenge or problem as you have. And you need stable investors. What justifies your living as a company is purchase orders. So on day one, you should start to figure out how do I get the purchase order? Not only how do I sell, but what does it take? If I meet a customer, I need to know what kind of purchase orders can he give me? What is the process? Does he have a limit? Is he already sold for two years with our competitor? We need to, to figure out all these things uh, as early as possible. And um, sometimes one of the investors would like to be a chairman, and they, they like to, uh, to have uh, kind of get the biggest salmon and fishing and all that, and we made sure that he did so. Um, I think that was a 12, 13 kilogram uh, salmon uh, just south of Trondheim, and uh, he was probably happy one year after that, just based on that uh, fishing uh, incident. So when our company was sold, I could go back to Carl Klingsheim, which is heading the tech transfer office in Trondheim, and say, uh, mission accomplished. We did it. Company sold. He could, go, he could get some money to his apartment, his department. Uh, he could give some money to uh, the inventor's department. Got a lot of good publicity. And he would probably uh, give him a new case to work on. And uh, just a funny thing about selling to industrial company, can you see what this is, what this is, and there, and there, and there? Gold. Yeah, gold. <laughs> the gold guys. Uh, if you look at those details, you can kind of have an idea what they like to talk about, how they behave, and um, what can I say? Uh, expensive habits. So uh, that was a good topic to discuss, and it helped up uh, get us a in a good mood. Uh, the day after selling the company, I was joy going, walking on a plane. Uh, the pilots were actually reading about us. I can see through the flight deck window that they're reading about us. Good feeling. <laughs> like it. And then a lot of people ask us, well, you succeeded now a little bit in each company, and it's growing like this. Why don't you take it a little bit further to earn more money? And do you know what the answer is? Sorry? I can't say that. I'm on TV. <laughs> um, it's not boring. It's really funny. We sold because we had a simple product, which was very good. It was well patented, but patents does not block anyone from copying you. So we were copied in Norway, in Sweden, in Canada, in South Africa. And do you think we had the money to be in court for five years in each of those markets? No. So we sold to someone who believed in the product, who had the money to, to uh, fight off those cases. And, and when someone bigger buys us, uh, those who copied us actually stopped because they didn't want to fight the big ones. All right. Thank you very much. All right.